Hello and welcome members. Today we are joined by Digital Engagement Director Laurel Allen, who will be sharing more about the new Isle Explore web app um, that the Academy has been working on with on island communities. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we get started. There are some instructions in the video description uh, to participate in YouTube chat. If you'd like to drop any questions for Laurel, um, we can have those answered at the end of the presentation. Well, without further ado, I am going to bring Laurel on stage. Hi, Laurel. Hi. Hi, you said without further ado, even though you swore not to. I told you, <laughs> it just comes out of my mouth. <laughs> well, welcome, <laughs> Laurel. Thank you for joining us for this special member program. Um, so excited to learn more about this app. Thank you so much for having me and thank you members for being here. We couldn't do what we do without you. So I'm really honored to talk to you about the work. Awesome. Well, I will bring your slides up and let you take it away. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Hello again. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Laurel Allen. I'm the Director of Digital Engagement at the Academy, and I am going to give you a sneak peek of Isle Explorer, which is a new web app that's part of the Islands 2030 initiative. Um, and when I say sneak peek, I mean that it's not actually launching until probably late summer. Um, so you're going to see rough drafts, you'll see rough uh, wireframes, you'll see placeholder copy, but we're just really excited to bring you into the work. Um, before I dive into the um, app, I want to give you a kind of brief overview or introduction to Island 2030. A lot of you probably already know about it, but for those who don't, um, it's one of the Academy's three major initiatives right now, and its mission is to halt biodiversity loss on five tropical archipelagos around the world by the year 2030. Uh, in partnership with and while empowering local communities. This initiative is co-directed by Academy curators, doctors Lauren Esposito and Raina Bell, from whom I stole this slide, which is what we use to explain why a scientific institution in San Francisco would actually care about um, islands in the first place. Islands actually contain the greatest concentration of biodiversity that exists on our planet, um, which is mind blowing. Um, and the, uh, the less, Awesome part of that is that 75% of all recent bird, reptile, amphibian, and mammal extinctions have taken place on islands. Um, and of the remaining reptile, amphibian, and mammal species, 85% are highly threatened, and that includes half of all birds. And of course, as island ecosystems you know, lose their functions and balance, the human inhabitants who depend on those lose their livelihoods and ways of life. Because islands are so critical um, and so vulnerable, they've actually always been a focus for the Academy. As a scientific institution, we've been working on islands for more than a century. And this footage is from a 1932 expedition to the Galapagos, but we've actually been working there since uh, 1905. If you uh, have been lucky enough to visit the Galapagos, you probably have spent time in or passed through Academy Bay. And that long uh, experience and history of work is actually true for all of the areas that Islands 2030 focuses on. So in addition to these being critical biodiversity hotspots, these five archipelagos, which from my left to right, maybe yours, uh, are the Galapagos, Lesser Antilles, Sao Tome and Principe, Madagascar, and the Philippines, are all places that Academy researchers have um, worked and collaborated for many decades. Uh, but to date, that work was done by individual scientists or small teams. Uh, Islands 2030 is special because it brings all of these places and pieces together and for the first time puts the full strength of the academy behind this work. So it's no longer just a scientist working alone in the field, but actually a full range of expertise that includes educators, communicators, marketing experts, exhibits teams, and, and really so much more. So we have science happening in all, um, at all times in all of these places, but that cohesive, bring everything to bear Islands 2030 approach has kicked off in the Lesser Antilles where those efforts add up to kind of four really big buckets. So first we have, of course, teams of scientists and researchers going into the field to document what species and populations are present, uh, how healthy they are and where we might really need to focus more attention or interventions um, to ensure the long-term sustainability of those species and ecosystems. And you can see some little clips of um, field work happening here, as well as a publication that came out that featured a, a really adorable gecko lit, if you want to take a close look. 
Uh, next is um, education and environmental learning. So this is happening on the island of St. Martin, um, but it's based on lessons learned right here in San Francisco and it's being led by Lindsay Bivings from our education department. This work is directly informed first and foremost by on island community listening sessions with teachers, parents, students, um, sharing what their needs and challenges are. And it's resulting in things like curriculum that center local biodiversity instead of just European biodiversity, Lessons plan, lesson plans that take kids outside, um, teacher development workshops, and, and really so much more. And next is a STEM leadership cohort. This is one of the most powerful aspects of Islands 2030. So through this program, we actually bring students from the areas that Islands 2030 works in to the academy um, where they are trained in world-class biodiversity science. So they're leading on the ground work in each of their islands or in their archipelagos. And as they onboard this experience um, and expertise, they're also growing into next-gen biodiversity leaders who will be a critical network for each other, as well as um, really transformational in their community's future. And last is convenings and community engagement. Um, on the left here, you'll see pictures from one of two big convenience, convenience we did that brought community leaders, nonprofits, NGOs, uh, island governments um, together, which doesn't actually happen that often here, to talk about a really wide range of issues. So everything from education to social change to increasing public access to nature and outdoor spaces, um, including the potential for the creation of the, the kind of first binational park um, around the only remaining um, natural uh, forest there that's left. And on the right, you see some pictures from a night hike. This is um, community work. This is one of the amazing things our scientists often do that's really, really powerful in helping people who never wandered down a trail before um, just get connected to nature in a whole new way. You know, they truly go from terrified of geckos to just completely in love with them in an hour or less. Um, and I think it says something really profound about how much all people really need and, and belong in nature. It just, it doesn't take much. Um, so cutting across all those buckets of work is my team um, seen here. We're kind of best known for social media, which is certainly, you know, the heart of a lot of work. Um, and a lot of what you see on our social channels looks really fun and casual and kind of spontaneous. And while we do definitely hope that it's fun for viewers, the reality is that everything you see there is actually really carefully and intentionally planned. Um, and considered because first and foremost, this is a team of um, deceptively serious science communicators. Beyond that, we're content strategists. So for every specific story or message, we wanna figure out the best way to ensure it reaches the right audiences. Um, and we're content creators. So we figure out how to tell the story, how we break it down to make it really accessible while still being very accurate, um, what format works best, what visuals are gonna make it easiest for people to engage and really care. Um, and umbrelling all of that is just the kind of long-term growth and care of the Academy's digital channels, which um, includes social media, but these days extends pretty far beyond that. Um, so as a team, day-to-day, -day, we're responsible for um, digital strategy for the Academy as a whole, as well as for each of the three global initiatives, um, driving the Academy's 3 million plus follower social media ecosystem, which is actually one of the largest and most highly engaged um, in the world within our vertical, which is all science and natural history museums, used in aquariums. Um, and that work is um, what we call organic, which is just the content that shows up in your feed, as well as behind the scenes paid social, which um, does do a lot of heavy lifting to drive revenue and admissions, but also um, uses some spend to really ensure that our science and our mission just reach millions and millions of people. Uh, and let's see, oh, and then there's more. Oh no, wait, now there's direct coverage. Okay, direct coverage of academy work at home and abroad. So that means our team literally will go, you know, whether it's in the basement to go to the coral lab to see what's happening there, or whether it's going into the field with scientists to cover the work um, and partners um, that we interact with there, we'll do that. And as we do that, we're collecting a lot of digital uh, assets, which just basically can mean uh, traditional photo and video. It can mean drone work, it can mean 360 work that then get used across all kinds of Academy um, channels. So you may see it in your membership emails that show up in your inbox or in your live publication or in the planetarium show. Um, so just kind of everywhere we can leverage that message and tell that story further. We provide the visuals for that often. And then there's the more category, which is live streams, virtual programming, digital fundraising, staff trainings, webcams, apps, public floor applic activations, and special projects. 
Um, so it's a big scope of work, but it's also really, really um, exciting. And we feel pretty privileged to do it. This is a, just kind of shows you the range of projects that we might be tackling at any given time. Um, so on the left, you see our new TikTok channel, which was launched less than a year ago and already has about 108,000 followers. Um, and it has also, though it looks quite silly and fun, it has a pretty serious goal, which is to paint a picture of science that, um, that seriously strengthens the STEM pipeline by working to ensure that we're painting a picture of science that, that really welcomes, attracts, and belongs to everyone. Um, and this is kind of self-serving, but we just got nominated for a Webby People's Voice Award and voting is open now through April 20th. So um, I'm gonna ask Jess to throw a link in the chat and if you have time to click it and open it and then look at it later and you wanna throw a vote our way, that would be great. You don't have to use TikTok or even know what it is, but if you love science communication that happens in public spaces, um, we'd appreciate a vote. So um, you'll have to give them your email as well because they're very serious about voting fraud, but we, but thank you in advance. Um, in the center is the Academy Livestream Studio. So this is a space that's being built out right now that all um, Academy teams will be able to use. And the goal is really to make sure that you as members and viewers, um, as well as the rest of our audience, anytime that you see an Academy Livestream, whether it's a membership program or education program or anything else, it's just really best in, best in class in terms of quality and accessibility and makes it very easy to engage with. Um, and on the right, we have a, um, another initiative project. This is for Thrive in California. This is a statewide influencer network. So these are digital influencers and creators across the state who we'll be working with to really amplify the mission and messages of Thrive in California. Um, the six people you see here are, have spent the last week at the Academy and they are functioning as our advisory board and they actually helped us build out a really impactful um, program that we think will substantively help to build a new movement for nature across the state uh, and really shift culture there. So that was an introduction to Islands 2030 and to my team quickly. And here's where all of that starts to intersect. For all of the initiatives, um, our first step is to um, do direct coverage that captures and tells stories that really amplifies the mission, the people, partners, and values of that initiative. But when we start to go further and think about ways to create broader impact, the first thing that we do is um, kind of survey the space to look for areas of opportunity. And one of the first things we noticed as we did that for islands, as we kind of started to survey the digital space around islands, is that there are a lot of islands apps out there um, and they're pretty um, consistently like not great. They're pretty terrible. They um, feature the same kind of basic categories of information, which is like attractions, restaurants, accommodations, transportation. Um, and that's because most of these apps are created by third parties that actually have nothing to do with the island. And they're literally just scraping the island's tourism website. They also generally charge a few dollars at least for these apps. Um, and when you do pay and download them, they're a pretty, pretty bad experience. So in a nutshell, these apps have one audience, which is tourists, and they're used one time, which is when that tourist visits. Um, and after that, they're probably deleted, not that like no quantifiable data there, but there's no reason to keep them around because they're not actually offering anything of substance that has lasting um, meaning or impact. Um, but it's kind of worse than not just providing anything of real value because what those apps are leaving out is actually really, really critical. Um, there's no real information about island biodiversity. There are no behaviors embedded that support deeper connections to nature, people in place. Um, they effectively kind of erase the people who live there. Uh, like if you just looked at the app, you wouldn't actually know that there were permanent residents or people who had grown up there and had lives there. And there's no focus on what makes that island unique or special. Um, and those things also tend to be the factors that, that inspire return. So those apps aren't really doing anything well, but for islands that, that want to do it differently and better, there are a lot of challenges to building an app. Um, we, my team, as well as a few other teams at the Academy that I'll introduce you to saw an opportunity um, to solve for a lot of those, but we really needed to pilot this thing um, and find a way to try it and test it. And for that, we needed a partner. So this is the island of Seba. Um, specifically, it's, um, this is some drone footage we captured of uh, a town called The Bottom, which is Seba's capital. Um, Seba is this incredibly magical place. It's only about 15 minutes away from St. Martin by plane. 
Um, it's very tiny, about five square miles. It has the shortest commercial runway in the world. Um, and it's home to about 1,900 people. Um, it also has incredible nature in large part because its coastline is so steep that it doesn't have any beaches, which means it hasn't been overdeveloped like a lot of other islands have. Uh, that also means that the tourism they do get on this small island is, is really important and they could use a little bit more um, attention. On the left, um, this woman is Lynn um, Con Costanaro. I don't say her last name out loud that often. And she's the founder of um, See and Learn Foundation, which is a partner for this app. She started See and Learn about 20 years ago. Um, it does a lot, but it's best known for um, an annual event where they bring scientists from all over to the island for a week to do public talks. Uh, they're also required to do a community event, and they also are required to go into the schools and do some kind of classroom activity or session. And it's actually, having been around for 20 years, has, has real measurable impact. Um, there's a nice story that one of the first kids who to experience a see and learn scientist in their classroom um, just returned to Seba after having grown up there as a conservation manager for the Dutch Caribbean Nature Alliance. Um, so it's that's a nice real world, nice real world impact. Um, one of our co-directors, Lauren Esposito, has been doing research on Seba for over a decade and has a long history with see and learn. So they became one of our earliest initiative partners. Um, but they also actively wanted an app. And Lynn, in fact, reached out to me to ask if I knew how to make one um, during the same time we were having discussions about this. So it was really serendipitous, both because of that partnership and because if you want a small island to pilot a people in nature app on, um, this five square mile like piece of magic is, is a good place to do it. So what is this thing? Um, this is a scalable web app created in partnership with island communities. Um, so first, what's a web app? Most of the apps that you're familiar with are um, probably native apps. And so those are designed for a specific platform or device like iOS or Android. Um, whereas an app is actually delivered on the web itself. Um, and that has a lot of advantages for a use case like this. So um, in comparison to a native app, uh, a um, web app is much faster and less expensive to build. It lets um, partners manage their own content because unlike a, um, a native app, which requires a developer to update and maintain, um, this is a much simpler backend. Um, it doesn't require approval from app stores the way native apps do, and it functions on all devices and platforms. So you don't have to build different versions for different um, devices. It'll just automatically work whether it's a desktop or a tablet or a mobile. Um, and it looks really, um, it looks really clean and and kind of custom built in each of those in each of those um, deliveries, uh, and that really supports a much wider um, range of audiences and use cases. And I think the other useful thing to tell you is that we're creating and um, the we're building the entire app and creating all the content for it in house. But the partnership piece of that means that we're working with our on island partner to determine what and who should be featured um, in that content and to really ensure that we're capturing all of the perspectives and priorities of the community um, itself. Uh, and once it launches, the partner is then responsible for just very light maintenance. So for example, if a trail closes or if one of the organizations featured changed their hours, something like that. And the scalable piece is um, because we are designing this to ultimately be rolled out to other archipelagos um, that we're working in. So anywhere where we have a strong partner who's interested in doing this, we can work with them uh, to create a version just for them. So Isle Explorer has five goals um, to increase visibility and appreciation for island biodiversity, to provide new ways for people to directly engage and connect with local nature, to promote the value of biodiversity as a tourism draw, and to increase on-island iNaturalist observations which are, are really so critical for um, scientists, researchers, and land managers trying to make um, good decisions or decide what else we need to understand. Um, and the last is that it really needs to center ease of use for partners. So we're building this platform on Squarespace, which is a super mainstream, super accessible um, platform that does require us to be very smart about streamlining functionality and keeping it as simple as possible but it means that it is inexpensive to maintain and that our partners won't have to hire um, for outside developers or skill sets. The audiences, um, 
we have that we're keeping in mind are five. Oh, we really think that an island app should have value for everyone, um, unlike the ones that I showed you before that just really serve tourists. So these are the audiences that we're working to serve as we design content and think about audience journeys. Um, first on island adults, as well as um, kids and educators. So we're thinking about new experiences um, and information for, uh, for adults, but we're also thinking about classroom use and how that might also translate then to taking it home and experiencing it with family um, and journeys like that. Um, tourists are really important for this. So we want to provide, um, we want to make this something that makes Sabo more attractive for all the right reasons. Um, and we're thinking about tourists both in terms of being at home and considering travel or considering destinations as well as being actually on the island. So what kind of different experiences can we offer someone who's sitting at home, you know, looking at their desktop, thinking about a trip and someone who's actually landed on the island and is using their phone to kind of navigate around or explore. Um, government and NGO conservation sectors, we can, we can definitely use some of this work to ensure that we're helping to reflect conservation and environmental priorities. Um, and last, hospitality and tourism uh, sectors. Um, this will, I think, and, and I should say SABA's tourism department also thinks really be a, a new kind of tool um, that centers kind of the most special things that SABA has to offer, which are truly its biodiversity and its people. So this is the Academy team. It's been done by three different departments and a whole host of people. Um, but this is the handful most directly involved. So Creative Studio is handling all of the visual designs from wireframes and visual branding and word marks, um, as well as user experience. And the web interactive team is handling all the other stuff behind the scenes in terms of development work on the platform itself. Uh, and then my team is handling all the content, so the writing and the visuals and the content strategy, as well as later figuring out how to um, help distribute and market the app and advise partners on that. And we'll pull in other experts from our division when we get to that stage. So the app itself, and again, keep in mind these, this may change. These are our kind of, um, this is what we're working with at the moment, obviously a homepage. The interesting thing to point out here, I think is just how different the um, desktop and the mobile view look. And one of the things this allows us to do is um, islands tend to have pretty low connectivity. So we do have to worry about how much people can download and um, that's not a concern with desktop. So for a desktop experience, there is the potential to offer a much more immersive experience. So more videos, more audio files, all kinds of stuff. And that'll be a really interesting thing to explore. Obviously an intro, and we're going to approach this from an ecological perspective. So what makes SEVA's, you know, biodiversity and geology so very special? Was there anything else I wanted to tell you there? No, not really. Um, and then we get into the real heart of it. So island biodiversity, we call this the flora and fauna section. Um, this will really center native keystone and charismatic species and provide really substantive information on what makes um, those native species and SEVA itself so incredible and worth caring about. Uh, it will integrate iNaturalist observations so that people can actually see observations of plants and animals that have been made. Um, one of the limitations of, of this app, the way that we need to build it is that we can't have those, those won't be embedded live, but we are look, but what we'll have to do instead and what we are doing instead is just looking for all kinds of opportunities to, um, to turn people into iNaturalist users. So it may link off directly to that site, but what you will see is a lot of um, the images and the copy for these species will be coming directly from iNaturalist. Um, and I think that really makes you, when you can actually see you know, where species have been seen um, and when you can see what's really out there, I think it really does make you look at the place around you and experience the place around you so much differently. You see an Ask a Scientist module here um, that will highlight people on island whenever possible or people whose work uh, directly connects to SABA. But wherever there's a gap, we'll use an Academy Scientist. We have such a, a broad range of expertise here that there's no shortage of experts. Um, and this also gives us a potential to um, put users and the public on alert for what species to watch for. If that's something that, for example, the conservation manager on island really needs, um, we can put those messages here. Hiking and walking trails seem really basic, but they are um, the kind of one of the easiest and best ways to encourage people to get out into nature. Um, so we'll do everything I can to, we can to make it clear that this is go as far as you can. You don't need any particularly special skills or equipment for most of these trails. 
Um, and to make it easy for people to understand what they're getting into and also what the rewards are of, of going up that hill. We'll use our natural observations here as well. So what people have seen along the trail and what you might hope to see. And again, encourage people to make their own observations. Um, and we'll include highlights, of course. So we can center the species that scientists and conservation managers need more information about. Um, and anything else we can do to lure people up these trails, often the very best stuff is closer to the top. And, uh, and Seba is more mm, strenuous than some islands on the hiking side. So this is um, this section for nature and cultural orgs. These groups do really critical work that, that really deserves more visibility. And we think there's a real opportunity here to showcase these organizations um, while also connecting people to the other people who do the work on a day-to-day -day basis in ways that feel a lot more human and engaging. So um, the kinds of orgs that will be included in this section are museums, conservation groups, libraries, community centers, um, we can showcase really important or critical on-island projects. Um, for example, Seba recently had to do a lot of um, goat eradication and because um, they eat so much and are so far ranging that it was causing a lot of erosion and other problems. Um, but that, of course, is if you're, if you're a tourist visiting Seba and you see goats getting shot, that can be really alarming. <clears throat> but if you have a tool that puts that in context and explains why that's actually good for the island and how it's being done, that makes it a very different experience. Um, and we also have an ask an expert module here that um, I think will go a long way in providing that connection to the people who are doing this kind of critical and often invisible work, which makes it just a lot easier to care about. Um, and this is the other heart in addition to the flora and fauna of the app, which is community stories. You, I think, connect completely differently with a place if you know the people who live there. Uh, people really are a place, and I think it's impossible to overstate how important that connection really is. Um, I think our humans are storytellers and story listeners, and it's really at the heart of how our species operates. So we want to bring that to every experience we can of nature or place. The grid of people that you see here are just a few of the people that my team sat down with and interviewed um, when we were there for a week at the end of February. So it was myself and two other specialists from my team. Um, and I'm gonna show where you'll see a few more of those stories in a minute, but um, overall, I think the community stories really offer a richer understanding and deeper connection to the people and culture of Seba. And um, the way that we intend to use them will let users uh, explore like standalone stories that aren't connected to a specific location, but also stories about a particular place um, or building, and we could potentially create walking itineraries that just string multiple community stories together. Sabre is really unique too, because if you go there, you will actually for sure see some of these people and they will talk to you. Um, but it'll be interesting to think about how we create that closeness and connection when we ultimately scale the app to larger islands. So to get the stories, um, our partner put this sign up for us everywhere. Um, and we tried to make it really um, not scary because most people don't go through, I mean, you go about your life, don't expecting to be interviewed, not expecting to be interviewed. So it could be a little bit intimidating at first. And then we did public, so we did seven public sessions where just anyone could come and sit down with us in public spaces and be interviewed about their lives on Seba. We literally pulled people off the street, um, offered cookies, whatever. Uh, but people were really, really receptive and, um, it's really humbling actually how much people will, will share with you and just how, I don't know, the, like the profundity of the stories that each one of us holds as humans, I think is, is pretty moving. In addition to those public sessions, we did several more sessions um, that were planned at places like the senior center. Uh, and we even set up a few, set up at a few restaurants and happy hours who were willing to host us. Cause that's obviously a, a great place to catch people really relaxed and talking. Um, and last, we did a series of individual appointments with people who were well-known and well-respected in the community as um, amateur historians or storytellers. So now I wanna um, play this video for you. It's just about three minutes long and it'll just introduce you to some of the people that we spoke with. Um, I'll just add that these aren't color corrected or, or audio corrected yet. Um, and you'll hear a range of accents, but with the exception of the urchin researcher, everyone you're about to um, C actually grew up on Seba. Okay, I'll go ahead and play. 
So you had it very busy? Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of interviews so far yeah. this week all okay. over. We were at Busy Bee, okay. we were at the Life Center, we were at the library. 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 Oh, that's my, my niece. Henrietta, yes, yes we met her. <laughs> yes, she was. Uh, do you mind if I put this on you? No, no, go ahead. My name is Henrietta Hassel. My name is James Franklin Johnson. My name is Otto DeVries. My name is Renisha Robinson. My full name is Alma Peggy Barnes. Is Arida Cracilia Heiliger. Oh, my name is Owen Hukuma. Etzel Lee. Okay, my full name is Elka Charles um, Simmons. How would you describe Saber's nature to someone who's never seen it? Breathtaking. I almost couldn't even say it because when I think on it, that's what I feel. And, you know, it's just unique. But you're asking the wrong person because I'm biased. I love this art. <laughs> That's a good question. Seba feels small to me. Absolutely not. Because Seba is this island, but Seba is also everything surrounding us, this ocean around us. Um, I get off the island. I go to St. Martin or wherever or to the States. And, you know, I can't wait to get back home. I grew up in the ocean. My mom was married to a fisherman. We grew up literally in the sea. Corals are not having a great time at the moment. It's a worldwide problem. They're degrading. Uh, but in the Caribbean, it's a, a very big problem. And especially in this part of the Caribbean, there's a lot of algae overgrowth of the reef. And uh, by adding sea urchins, they can graze away the algae. And the corals have a chance to, to recover and to, to survive. We swim in the harbor. It's a bit dangerous because, you know, sharks and everything. But it's a, such a thrill. If you look at some of the pictures of the past, we see that there were no pier or anything, so it was just rocks. And there's where we learned to swim. My dad would take us out and teach us to swim. And then when he think that we were strong enough to swim, he would take us out f um, further. So they had a rock out in the sea, and then he would put us there and say, well, okay, don't swim back. I go back eight generations. My family started living on Seba on the west side of the island since 1665. I used to do a lot of farming with my father, my brother David, and my uncle McDonald. Um, at that time, a lot of farming. It was like an everyday thing. You, um, at that time, 60, 70 years ago, there was a much you had to farm, otherwise you couldn't survive. I remember being in the drum band, and we used to you know, dress up very formal. We had the hat and the tie and everything. There are some moments you still get stuck, like, oh, you know, on Saturday I was walking towards my home and then there was this sunset and I, was, I really literally had to stop and like, take a picture. Just the view and the nature of it is amazing. What does it mean to you to be Sabin? One proud person, I can say. Being Sabin, you have a different way of living. It's my heritage, it's in my culture, it's in my blood. I love being a Sabian. I love to care all the history and all the different things that we do here. I love to do it. I'm just proud. Me and Sabian is being proud. And then I'm one proud Sabian. <laughs> yeah. I hope you liked it. So you had it very busy. Um, so in, in addition to, to many of the interviews we collected being featured in the app, all of the community stories um, we filmed will be deposited with the Queen Wilhelmina Library in the bottom so that everyone in the community has access to every single one of them. Uh, and we'd also love in the future to work with them on a little mini exhibit as well so that there's a physical presence for people to enjoy too. Uh, most of this is not worth looking at, but the point of it is that we are set to launch again, late summer 2023. Um, so again, we're just, but we, you know, love welcoming people into it early because it's really useful to hear questions and thoughts and perspectives um, as we work. And I'm going to wrap up, but before I do, I wanted to just mention two quick things. The first is that if you'd like to um, learn more about the Islands 2030 initiative overall, we have a really great new video on the Academy's YouTube page. I'll ask uh, Jess to drop a link in the chat for it. Um, it's only about three and a half minutes long, and it's, um, it's really good at pulling you deeper into the initiative. And Islands 2030 is the theme of this year's um, Big Bang Gala and Party After Dark, which is coming up on April 27th. So if you're local, uh, highly, highly um, recommend that you um, join us for that. 
And I think that's really it. I really appreciate having the chance to talk to you um, and would love to take any questions or even if you just have thoughts or suggestions, that's great too. It's all really, really, really helpful at this point. And thank you again. Awesome, thank you, Laurel. It was so interesting to learn about the app. Um, please uh, drop any questions you have um, in the chat. We do have instructions if you um, need some help getting to the YouTube chat. Um, but I did have, so I had some couple questions, Laurel. Um, so with um, Seba being the first island, what might be the next we scale to for this app? Yeah, I think this, I think their next choice will be, it'll have to be really strategic because there will be, it'll be wanting to test a bigger island and also a more complex one because Seba's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. There's not a lot of things to navigate. People are, they kind of know us already. They're really welcoming. I, we have a partner on St. Martin called the, um, Nature Foundation St. Martin, which is who we work with on a lot of the education work I shared out earlier. And they've said that they would really like to for us to scale there next and that they'd like to be the partner there. And I think that actually is a really good choice because it's bigger, it's a much more complex environment. It's actually half, um, half French and half Dutch. So they're two separate sides to this island. Um, and it doesn't have much um, public space or outdoor nature space. So the trail section there would serve a really completely different and really critical need, which is actually to tell people how to access nature in the first place. Um, and it might need to look a bit different because our trail system is, you know, it's not anywhere close to as developed as Sabas is. But I think that would be a really good test of the app's ability to, to kind of expand and change to really suit the needs of the community. So I think that's next. Very cool. That's exciting. Um, the, the hiking in the trails was very interesting to me as a, as a hiker. <laughs> um, I loved it. <laughs> um, what, how do we get to Seba? Is, is it accessible for, you know, members to, to go visit? It is. Um, it always, I know it looks so like exotic and, and remote and it, you know, is those things, but actually all you have to do is fly to St. Martin, which is a pretty, um, traditional and accessible vacation destination. And then you literally just jump on a little prop plane. It takes, no kidding, like 15 minutes or less. Um, and there are two flights each way every day. You can also take a ferry, but they call it the Vomit Comet. So I'm sticking with the airplane. Um, <laughs> oh, but yeah, and the, there are nice hotels in the island. There's not that many of them, but, um, but they are really nice. And um, I really encourage everybody who, if you were like remotely excited about those images, you should go. And the hiking is incredible. That's awesome. Uh, how can our members stay uh, up to date with the progress of the app and I guess the Islands Initiative as a whole? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I, once the app comes out, we will, we will like push news of it on all the channels. So hopefully, Jess, I can get you to put it in member e-news and, um, and our communications department will do a press release about it and you will see it on our social channels. Um, so we'll make a big deal out of it when it's live. And um, and members can be really helpful in being kind of among the first earlier beta testers. Uh, and I'd love that and love feedback on it as well. But we'll for sure keep everyone updated. Well, that's awesome. Um, we don't have any questions okay. from members, um, but I think they're probably still processing all the beauty and all the amazing stories they heard. Um, anything else you'd like to share, I guess, before we say goodbye? I don't think so. Just if, you know, if people do have questions or if you do have feedback or thoughts, um, just you can, well, you can let us know on any of the social channels. Um, and, and my email um, is lallen at Cal Academy, and I'm happy to get feedback on the app as well from members. Um, no one else, just members, please. <laughs> I just realized that might have been a mistake, but I trust you with the information. Um, no, I don't think so. I think just to say that we are, you know, this is, this is really exciting work and, um, and it is a real privilege to be able to go work directly with communities as, as we do it and plan it. I think, you know, the Academy does so much, you know, gigantic and meaningful and enormous work, um, and seeing it actually happen on the ground and I feeling it, how real it actually is in that way, um, is, is just so powerful as someone who's been, I've been with the Academy for nine years now, but I think, yeah, the, the opportunity to actually see real world impact um, is really amazing. And, and my team's gonna work really hard to make sure that all everyone, you know, especially our members um, can see what that looks like as well. So nothing else, but thank you very much for having me. 
Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see the app come together. So thank you for sharing to the members and Thanks. thank you members for joining us today. Um, we will see you next time. Have a great rest of your day.